Hello and welcome to your Region This Week's election special. In this episode, we will be showing interviews with the leaders who visited the region. We will also be showing you up-to-date lists of candidates in the surrounding ridings ahead of the election. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer visited the region on September 24th. Here's the interview with Andrew Scheer speaking with the Mike Farwell Show. And Andrew Scheer joins us by phone as he makes his way to this community. Mr. Scheer, we thank you for the time. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me on. This uh, announcement you made this morning that uh, is going to ease, make it easier for companies to pay dividends to family members, what does that look like on the ground? Well, basically, we recognize the fact that many small business owners have had their spouse share in the risk, the uh, difficult years, the uh, supporting the business in a variety of ways that is often very difficult for Revenue Canada to determine and to document. And so rather than have uh, spouses, wives, or husbands have to fill out multiple reams of paper showing, uh, you know, minuting every time that they help support their 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 family business. We're just going to exempt them from the liberal tax cycle altogether and recognize the, the sacrifice they make to help make sure these small businesses succeed. I wanted to ask a little bit more about an announcement you made yesterday, Mr. Shear, as well, on housing. And this would be, give Canadians the ability to take out mortgages amortized at 30 years, as well as reducing or easing the stress test for first-time home buyers. Are, are you not concerned that those policies would increase both home prices and debt levels? Uh, no, uh, specifically with the 30-year amortization, this is a, a very targeted measure, measure to first-time home buyers, and we know that uh, studies have shown that most young couples who purchase their first home see their income go up as the years go by, and uh, so they're actually more uh, easier to uh, maintain those mortgage rates as they go into the future. Uh, this is something that uh, that industry experts have have looked at as, as striking the right balance between uh, ensuring that debt levels are are manageable and uh, making it a little easier for young couples to get into into new homes. And on the stress test, there are a lot of unintended negative consequences that... uh that uh, that the stress test brought in. For example, uh, you ca- you don't have to go through a stress test if you switch banks. Uh, sorry, you, you don't have to go through a stress test if you stick with your original bank at a time of renewal. And that means that banks can really uh, hold some people hostage to a higher rate because they don't have to uh, compete with other lenders. So uh, that's something that we're going to address by reviewing the stress test as well. You mentioned Liberal leader Justin Trudeau and his personal brand, and you have pointed out uh, on more than one occasion with with fairly good evidence, Mr. Scheer, that there seems to be a bit of a double standard with Mr. Trudeau when it comes to the SNC-Lavalin affair and, of course, the most recent blackface scandal. However, during this campaign, you yourself have decided to had Conservative Party candidates who have made either hateful, homophobic or racist comments. And you've said, and I'll quote you here, I accept the fact that people make mistakes in the past and can own up to them and accept that. Now, if Justin Trudeau has apologized for his mistake, why are you still asking him to resign? Uh, well, first of all, I'm ask- I asked him to resign when it came out that he politically interfered in a criminal court case, uh, and that's uh, that's when he lost the moral-, moral authority to govern. It's now up to Canadians to determine who's going to be prime minister of this country. But I pointed out the fact that it is so hypocritical for Justin Trudeau to demand other people resign, uh, to condemn people for things they did long ago, and then plead for forgiveness for himself. He won't even hold himself to the standards that he sets for other people. It's his fakeness, his phoniness, the fact that even when he apologized, he lied about how many times he had done it. And now he still can't answer uh, to Canadians if he's done it since 2001. So he's a complete fraud and a phony on these types of things. And people are sick and tired of, of the hypocrisy and the fact that he always says one thing but does another. If you were to pick, Mr. Shear, the one issue that resonates most loudly in this campaign, what is that issue for you? It's definitely affordability and the cost of living. Uh, I believe the ballot question in this election is who do you trust to make life more affordable and help you get ahead? It's certainly not Justin Trudeau. We can't trust anything he says. He lies and he breaks promises. He certainly is not making life more affordable. He's raising taxes. His carbon tax is going to have to go up massively to achieve uh, the, the, the goals he set for himself. We know that's going to make home heating, gasoline, groceries more expensive. Our plan is all based around leaving more money in the pockets of Canadians so they can get ahead. Mr. Shear, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. The first riding we will be looking at is Kitchener-Conestoga. This riding is currently held by Conservative MP Harold Albrecht, 
who is seeking re-election. The candidates looking to take over the seat are Tim Lewis of the Liberal Party, Rihanna Duet of the New Democratic Party, Stephanie Gertz of the Green Party, and Colton Waller of the People's Party. The next riding we're looking at is Kitchener Centre. This riding is currently held by Liberal MP Rod Saney, who is seeking re-election. The candidates looking to take over the seat are Stephen Woodworth of the Conservative Party, Andrew Moraga of the New Democratic Party, Mike Morris of the Green Party, Patrick Bernier of the People's Party, and Alan Pappenberg of the Animal Protection Party. Rogers TV held debates of local writings during this campaign. You can watch them on our website, rogerstv.com, under our election section. Your Region This Week will be right back after this. Welcome back. Liberal Party leader Justin Trudeau visited the region twice during the campaign. His first appearance was on the sixth day of the campaign. Here is the interview with Justin Trudeau speaking on the Mike Farwell Show. So, Mr. Trudeau, welcome to the 570 News Studios here in Kitchener. What brings you to town? Great opportunity to be back in KW. Obviously, uh, we have a great team here, and uh, it's been a really important place for generating growth for the country. We know there's a lot of great, hardworking families who've been uh, building the future here in KW, and uh, I'm always happy to be back to uh, uh, listen to people. Today, we've got a big announcement uh, focused on kids, and uh, we're really excited about it. This was a region that was uh, entirely blue until 2015. Do you feel there are seats here that need to be shored up? Oh, no. I think uh, the, the work that people People like uh, Bartis Chagger and others have been doing here in this region have been just amazing. People have seen the impact of four years of a government that's chosen to invest uh, in KW, invest in families and grow the economy. Our emphasis on making sure people are prepared and confident about the future uh, has really resonated here and we've we still got a lot of work to do but we're going to keep doing it. Those Canadians that you've been talking to, Mr. Trudeau, uh, have been talking a lot about SNC-Lavalin. You have decided to not waive cabinet confidence in this regard for the RCMP to do an investigation. Do you think Canadians deserve to know more about the SNC-Lavalin affair? Actually, we gave an unprecedented waiver of cabinet confidence and uh, solicitor-client privilege uh, to allow everything related to this matter to be investigated by committees, uh, by the ethics commissioner, uh, by parliamentarians. That approach uh, has allowed people to understand what actually happened there. But the core of the issue is, my job is Prime Minister is to stand up for Canadians jobs and that's exactly what I was doing throughout. Do you think Canadians know enough about what happened? I think uh, the conversations I have with Canadians are focused on their jobs, focused on their future, focused on where this country is going. And quite frankly, people talk to me a lot about the choice we're making between going back to the Harper years or moving forward uh, with confidence into uh, into continuing what we're doing. You were in the GTA yesterday, and uh, unfortunately in Mississauga, where you were, there had just been a shooting in the overnight. And here we're hearing news this morning that there was another in the GTA in Brampton this time. Right here in our community, in the region of Waterloo, we have seen unprecedented gun violence, and it's got people concerned. Do you have any plans, if you form government again, to do something about gun violence? Uh, yes, absolutely. We're going to have more to say about how we're going to strengthen gun control in this country, because keeping our community safe is a huge priority. But we also committed to do that in the last election and delivered on those commitments. We significantly strengthened gun control in meaningful ways uh, over the past year. Unfortunately, the Conservatives have announced they're going to roll back uh, those gun control protections, uh, which I think is moving in the wrong direction. Canadians need to be safe. We're not in the pocket of the gun lobby like the Conservatives seem to be. Seem to be. We're going to keep moving forward with strong measures to keep Canadians and their communities safe. What is the single greatest issue for you, Mr. Trudeau, in this election? Uh, it's going to be the economy. Who has a plan to deal with an economy in which uh, protecting uh, yeah, our environment from climate change, uh, empowering uh, 
Canadians, their kids, but also working Canadians to be able to adjust to the changes in the workforce, uh, recognizing a uh, global context that is shifting, preparing Canadians for the economy of the future is what we're very much focused on. We've been doing a great job over the past four years. We've uh, seen Canadians create over a million jobs while at the same time we've lifted 900,000 people out of poverty, including 300,000 kids. But we know there are still families who are worried, uh, who are struggling, and there's more to do. And that's what we're focusing on, making sure that people can have confidence in their future uh, by continuing to move forward. Your plan for climate change and climate action is a carbon tax. It's been contested in several provinces, including right here in Ontario. How confident are you or what makes you confident that this is the right plan for climate moving forward? Well, first of all, you can't have a plan for the economy if you don't also have a plan to fight climate change. And that's what conservative politicians don't seem to understand. They still think that if you make pollution free, we're somehow going to be better off. That is not the case. We've put a price on pollution right across the country. And unfortunately, conservative politicians are fighting that. We know that Canadians want to see a movement on fighting against climate change, which is why we're a government that has done more to fight climate change, more to protect the environment than any government in Canadian history, while at the same time, we need to make sure it's affordable for people. That's why in Ontario, our price on pollution returns more money to families than they are expected to pay for that price on pollution. That focus of making a a strong plan to fight climate change while making it affordable for Canadians is central to our plan. And quite frankly, the only reason the Conservatives seem to be fighting against it is ideology, because it actually is more affordable for Canadians. Mr. Trudeau, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. The next riding we're looking at is Brantford Brant. The riding is currently held by Conservative MP Phil McColeman, who is seeking re-election. The candidates looking to take over the seat are Danielle Takas of the Liberal Party, Sabrina Sawyer of the New Democratic Party, Bob Yonkman of the Green Party, Dave Robel of the People's Party, Jeffrey Gallagher of the Veterans Coalition Party, and Independents Leslie Bory and John Chermel. Next, we'll be looking at Cambridge. This riding is currently held by Liberal MP Brian May, who is seeking re-election. The candidates looking to take over this seat are Sonny Atwell of the Conservative Party, Scott Hamilton of the New Democratic Party, Michelle Braniff of the Green Party, David Haskell of the People's Party, Manuel Kutu of the Marxist-Leninist Party, and George McMorrow of the Veterans Coalition Party. Remember, you can always rewatch these debates on our website, rogerstv.com, in our election section. Your region this week will continue right after these messages. Welcome back. Green Party leader Elizabeth May visited the region on September 16th. Here's an interview of when she spoke with Brandon Graziano on Kitchener Today. Green Party leader Elizabeth May joining me this afternoon uh, for the second uh, time, I guess, in the second campaign, I should say, uh, especially for this uh, region here. I mean, we have uh, University of Waterloo, we have Laurier, we have Conestoga, University of Guelph as well, uh, offering free tuition. I mean, that's something that a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of students anyway, uh, like to hear. But how would that be rolled out? We need to recognize that K-12 to isn't the end of having a right to education in Canada. So we want to inject $10 billion through federal provincial transfer payments, but tied to post-secondary institutions so that the university administrators who are hearing us call for getting rid of tuition recognize that we know they have to be able to sustain themselves and be able to hire tenure-track professors and reduce the, you know, some of the universities these days, first-year university classes, if the kids in the back can see the professor from the back of the bleachers, I'd be surprised. We need to restore and protect our our post-secondary education system to maintain its excellence. 
Yeah, and, and then after they graduate, uh, we're wondering about, you know, jobs and such, but w- one of the other things that uh, that you want to address as well is the housing crisis to actually house right. these people once they have jobs and uh, good jobs and, and right. whatnot. And I'm, I'm curious as to how you're going to address the, the housing crisis that's affecting uh, pretty much all of Canada. The weirdness of this for someone my age, 65, it used to be the case, that there would be no housing prices in a community beyond the reach of the people who lived in that community because housing prices were set to meet local demand. Housing has now become a global commodity in which people who don't live in your community want to invest. So one way we'll deal with this is trying to suppress the demand for housing that doesn't meet local needs. We also want to increase the housing stock by encouraging developers to build purpose-built rental housing We used to have a federal tax incentive that made that happen. We killed it in the early 1970s, and that's why most of the rental units that you look at uh, were built in the 1970s before we got rid of this tax incentive. There are many steps to be taken to ensure that every Canadian is housed in a house that they want, that they can afford, and meet their needs. And there's uh, there's already been criticism um, here just in regards to a lot of your, I mean, there's more than just, uh, of course, I know you mentioned a universal pharmacare plan here, but I want to la- ask this last question here. I mean, the whole thing that a lot of people are asking now uh, of the Green Party is how we plan to pay for it all. Well, we have submitted our whole budget, and we did back in June, to the Parliamentary Budget Office. It was clearly our intention, Brandon, to have the plan, today's platform, released uh, it, with the budget attached. We're very close to finishing the costing with the Parliamentary Budget Office. has been fantastic. They assigned a senior analyst to work to make sure that we knew where our revenue was coming from, how much our promises would cost. But because we wanted to make sure that every element of our plan was costed uh, by an, an, a nonpartisan governmental agency, and what a wonderful opportunity it is to have platform costing by the, the Parliamentary Budget Office, with your party platform here, I mean, right. when you started it off completely, um, you're really putting a focus on the rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, I mean, how is that different than what from we have uh, now, and what are you proposing exactly? Yeah, well, we, we actually, the focus is on all Canadians. Uh, we're looking at making life more affordable for Canadians in the context of transforming our economy to one that will sustain our kids in the future by dealing with the climate crisis. The Indian Act is a fundamentally a racist piece of legislation. I I don't know how many Canadians know that when South Africa was designing apartheid, they used our Indian Act as a way of figuring out how to do it. And I think there may have been, there certainly have been good intentions from other party leaders. I wouldn't say that there weren't. I I think Stephen Harper's historic apology for the residential schools was, was really important. But we haven't acted to ensure that Indigenous children have a fair start in life. Our policy platform, it looks at, of course, the usual list of things that need fixing, like safe drinking water and and adequate housing. But it's much, much more fundamental in saying, when we talk about respecting the rights of Indigenous people in a nation-to-nation relationship, they define what their nation is, not the government of Canada, but but self-determination and self-government and acknowledgement of territory and governance structures that come uh, from the integrity of Indigenous identity. The next riding we're looking at is Guelph. The riding is currently held by Liberal MP Lloyd Longfield, who is running for re-election. The candidates looking to take over the seat are Asit Sechen of the Conservative Party, Aisha Jongir of the New Democratic Party, Steve Dick of the Green Party, Mark Paralovos of the People's Party, Juanita Burnett of the Communist Party, Gordon Truscott of the Christian Heritage Party, and independents Cornelis Clevering and Michael Waslin. Continuing on, the riding next is Wellington, Halton Hills. This seat is currently held by Conservative MP Michael Chong, who is seeking re-election. The candidates looking to take over the seat are Leslie Barron of the Liberal Party, Andrew Bascom of the New Democratic Party, Ralph Martin of the Green Party, and Syl Carl of the People's Party. For more information on where you can vote, visit the Elections Canada website, elections.ca. Welcome back. Unfortunately, New Democratic leader Jagmeet Singh did not visit our region during this campaign. 
The next riding we're going to list is Kitchener South Hespler. The riding is currently held by Liberal MP Marwan Tabara, who is seeking re-election. Those looking to take over the seat are Alan Kiso of the Conservative Party, Wasai Rahimi of the New Democratic Party, David Weber of the Green Party, Joseph Todd of the People's Party, Elaine Betts of the Marxist-Leninist Party, and Matthew Correa of the Veterans Coalition Party. Next, we're looking at the riding of Perth Wellington. The riding is currently held by Conservative MP John Nader, who is seeking re-election. Those looking to take over the seat are Perry Mitchell of the Liberal Party, Jeff Crowter of the New Democratic Party, Colin Simmons of the Green Party, Roger Furr of the People's Party, and Irma DeVries of the Christian Heritage Party. The last but not least riding we will be looking at is the riding of Waterloo. Waterloo is currently held by Liberal MP Bardish Chagger, who is seeking re-election. The candidates looking to take over the seat are Jerry Zhang of the Conservative Party, Laurie Campbell of the New Democratic Party, Kirsten Wright of the Green Party, and Erica Traub of the People's Party. Don't forget, you can always check your local writings debate on our website, rogerstv.com, in our election section. For more information on where you can vote, visit the Elections Canada website, elections.ca. On Election Day, I will be co-hosting the local results live alongside Dan Polishchuk, right here on Rogers TV at 9.30 p.m. We will stay on the air until all your local writings declare their elected officials with panel discussions from Mike Farwell at 570 News. Next week, your region this week will be showing the best of last summer's stories. A new episode of your region this week will air Friday, November 1st at 7 p.m. Thanks for watching and don't forget to vote.